I got to tell you, man, this is like a serious surprise and and treat for me. Just to I actually, love that you didn't if know. this is what it takes for me to get to talk to you, uh, I'm I'm in. You know, I knew you were when you were a little kid. You know, and yeah. I've watched you through your different phases and become, you know, a, a legend. You know, well, uh, thank no, you. no, I'm not, not. You know, I don't, I don't BS, man. So, which we should talk about this, um, the element of retaining your natural individuality as a musician and being able to turn that dial. I, I, I use the, you know, when I'm mentoring guys, I, the visual of a dial. How much do I mix me into this room today or how much do I turn it down, whatever the case may be? You know, you don't want to ever get rid of your inherent musical DNA, but part of being a session musician, to me, take that dial and read the room and on any given day determine where that dial setting needs to be sitting to make it, the song happen. Okay, so I love that concept, and I and I think it's interesting, too, that you bring it up because you were probably one of the guys that I saw the most growing up in the studio, and I think that's because of your voice and because of what you were talking about. I, I remember I was thinking about this on the way here, and, and in my memory, it's probably a lot goofier and funnier than what it was. I remember walking into a studio, and you had a... You had a pizza box and a brush and you were standing up and there's mics around and you're doing a little dance because you've got fucking jingle bells <laughs> on your ankles. <laughs> oh. And so that's, you know, I, that was my memory of, of, of seeing a session drummer. I'm sorry, man. No, so but, I completely screwed you up from the beginning. But what's so <laughs> funny is now, you know, like there's this whole culture of watching YouTube videos of guys trying to figure out how to do goofy shit that's not conventional, sit right. down and play the kid right. stuff. Yeah. You've been doing that for fucking 40 years. Yeah. And I wasn't the first. Well, because I was inspired by people. Absolutely. You know? But you, you know, I think about it all the time. And I, I think about your approach, adding that extra thing or bringing that extra little bit of creativity. I mean, I recently I listened to Anthony Skinner's record that oh. y'all cut, you know, 25 years ago or whatever it was. And there's there's so many things. And it really was just this one song. It's called Deeper Down. Um there's so many things in that song from the drum chair that blow my mind. Mm. There's so much creativity just in these little sonic textures. Mm. So it it does interest me too that you you talk about the mix knob because I feel like you're the kind of guy that if I knew what you were capable of, I'm going to hire you because of you. Always. Mm. I'm always going to have you there and, and then, you know, I'm not a producer, and so I don't know how this works right? in everybody's mind individually. But I, I am curious, like, if your mix knob is the same as what the producer wants your mix knob to be, because yeah. you may not be aware of how cool your voice truly is and how, if you're there, there's a good chance that somebody wants you to be more you. Yeah. And I, you know, that's a hard line for us to be because absolutely you can't walk into a session and go, "Hey, it's really cool that I'm here." A, was I the first call? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. You know, because if you were expecting Scott Williamson, oh yeah, then I, you know, I have to think differently. Mm -hmm. If that's what you were trying to get, then I have to try and you know figure out how to use my hands properly. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> what did inspire you to sort of take? a slightly unconventional approach to drumming from time to time. Like wh who were some of the guys that were doing that before that yeah. I don't know about? My conceptual strengths and creativity, I think pretty far ahead of my physical capabilities on a drum set. You're not going to see me on YouTube playing stuff, but put me put me in context and give me, you know, enough rope to, to flex that creative 
strength, then that's going to come out. Not necessarily the pizza box and the, you know, that's probably an extreme and that was probably an overdub or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but that kind of, of, uh, of creative thinking is, is a little more natural to me than you would think. The inspiration for me to do that, that kind of creative stuff doesn't necessarily come from drummers. Yeah. It just comes from concepts. And, you know, also during that time, you know, which was probably, if I'm not mistaken, in the 90s, mm -hmm. there was a real trend of, uh, they called it unplugged. And it was the very beginning of that. And so I, I was uh, asked to be there and be a drummer, but we don't want you to be a drummer a lot of times. So, oh, so I was yeah. like, well, you know, but we want more than a conga going boom, back, go, boom, boom. You know, we want way more than that, but we don't want as much as, you know, uh, one of my favorite things to do is, is, is singer songwriter music where there's a human with either a guitar or a piano, usually, it could be any instrument though, that has written a song and that is singing said song and performing it. And when they perform it, it's almost like, wow, they don't need anything else. That's beautiful. Particularly still do more of that when I'm by myself at home. I was just going to ask, is that yeah. a home thing? Yeah, I do. I, I spend more time. I try to find ways where you listen to it and you're like, there's some overdubs going on. And mm. I'm going, there's not any overdubs going on. The oh. shakes and the hand drum over to the left being mic'd and the, the resonant kick drum being mic'd and the everything's padded down or the, the rattles and the hanging stuff from cymbals and the bells and just the odd sounds that you're talking about. And just, so most no, of that is baked in now. It, it can be. It yeah. can be. I, I would say there's less in, in the more modern trend, you know, there's, it's not as popular now. It's not as, you know, much of a, of a, a part of our musical uh, trendy vocabulary now, but I still find ways to uh, sneak it in or, or, or utilize that. What are some of your overdub things and some of the stuff that you do at home? Like what are some of the, the little tricks and gags and pizza boxes and shakers? And I wouldn't say that, that my go-to is, is a secret. I'm good at manipulating drums to sound tucked in and smaller or more percussive function in a setting you know, where there's like this perky loop vibe going on and a drum set and kind of combining all that stuff and make it happen organically and dynamically in a live performance. You know, a lot of times, man, I, I just deaden the snare and, and turn the snares off and don't use sticks and use my hands. See, that's this is what I'm asking about. And and then okay, so I don't want the kick drum to be smacky. So I put a I put a, a mallet up there. What beater do you use for that, by the way? Because I've had an issue with finding one that I like. Oh, yeah, because the because the weight of it, right, is is funky. Well, and a so, lot of times there's still too much attack. Oh, well, okay. So in that case, if there's too much attack, yeah, because a lot of times you might not have time to change the bass drum. Right. So the way to change the bass drum, if there's still too much attack with the, 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 the mallet beater, just get yourself a hand towel or different layers of uh, paper towels. Just freaking duct tape it to the, to the beater head. To the batter side. Yeah. Because I've seen to guys... To where the mallet hits the, the... Okay, the reason they're putting that on the other side is to stop the front from head from resonating right. as much, which is another trick, you know. Or sometimes I'll just... I have a, 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 a pillow on the outside of my kick drum just laying on the floor. You know, it's a pillow up against the head. Right. So what's happening? It's not resonating as much. Oh, if I move the pillow down three inches and only this much of the pillow is touching the head now, now it resonates a little bit. Right. Oh, I'm going to run around there. Okay, boom. Okay, now it's got the, the right length that I want. 
or okay, the the, the paper towels, they're, they're, it's still a little bit too pointy. I just want the most mellow, almost like heartbeat feeling thing without an attack before I'm going anywhere and turning any EQ knobs or anything, right? Right. This is all just like, what can I do at my instrument? Do you have any treatment for cymbals at all? Do you ever like put gels on them or tape them? Or <laughs> Dude, right now I'm at home. It's funny that you ask. So <laughs> what I do is, and I learned this from Josh Emmons, who I love him. He gives Sweet me Josh. hope for the, the future of of engineering and he folded up the duct tape into a strip and then he had a piece of masking tape on the end of that kind of hanging off the masking tape you attach to the symbol and then the sticky parts of the duct tape aren't showing so it can it's just, just move. it's folded so it's just uh, it's just kind of floating mm -hmm. and it's making my de my decay shorter and in turn, also making the symbol a little darker. I, I, I haven't taken them down in like two months. I That's love a it. Great trick. I've always just put the piece of tape on, but then it doesn't. It it kills your initial attack. Yeah, um, which can be desirable. Sometimes that's what you're going for. Uh, but that's awesome. I didn't. Yeah. I've never thought of. And that's that. not a new concept. Like I can remember, it was either uh, Paul Lime or or Eddie Bears. Probably Paul Lime. He used to do this trick with a, a cymbal felt. You duct tape the cymbal felt to it, and you put it on the toms or the snare. And so the felt is laying on the drum, but the duct tape is, a, is not attached to the drum. It's attached to the rim. So when you hit the drum, that it flies up, and then it comes down. And so the microphone doesn't really hear it, and it shortens your decay or mutes it somehow. So it's basically the same concept as that that I'm using on cymbals. I would rather manipulate the drums now while I'm working on the song and play them, play to that sound. I am so OCD affected by the sonic thing in my headphones. It can, it can ruin my session or it can make my day. Right. Actually, I shouldn't even say that because that's about me. It can actually make m the music for the artist and the producer better, you know, or worse. Right. Depending on the way I'm hearing myself, the way I'm hearing the guitar player, the way I'm hearing everything. So are you vocal about that on sessions? Like, let's say, for example, have you ever said, hey, is there any way we can put a little brightness on that guitar? Or like, have oh, you ever asked about other instruments or yeah, anything? Is that, do you go you, that far? Well, usually if I'm noticing a problem with another instrument, I can kind of like not open my mouth and know that it's going to be addressed. It'll get dealt with. Because either the player or one of the other players that actually play notes are going to, you know, man, the piano is just too bright in the headphones. <laughs> you know, you know, generally yeah. I don't have to, I don't have to be the guy to do that. Sometimes when drummers cross their boundary lines, it, it can, it can be weird. problematic. <laughs> it can get weird. So I was just, that was just like, hey, do you do that? But when it comes to drum mix stuff, do you? I, I'm not scared to. Okay. I'm not scared to. You know, and, and a lot of times it's like, okay, deep breath. Don't be negative. <laughs> just, you know, it sounds very terrible right now but you don't need to come at it from that point of view with the engineer and producer just hey can we the quiet just by starting there can we yeah i think that's that's a a, a, a nice way to start you know is, is make sure it is a request and not a demand hey um i was wondering is there possibly a little too much click on the bass drum and in my brain i'm going there's way too much freaking. <laughs> Could you please move your hand over to that EQ and turn that shit down? Because, you know, <laughs> that's what I'm thinking, but that's right. not what I'm saying. But, you know, w a problem with that is when you're working, you know, we all work in our little home studios. We got it sounding the way we want to sound. It. Right. Oh, absolutely. I and mean, that's part of the game that we play. Yeah. You know, as session musicians is, is adaptability. 
drums being an acoustic instrument, the same drum kit is going to sound different in this room that we're sitting in right now than it is in my studio or, 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 or at Omni or at, you know, Blackbird or whatever, fill in the blank. On any given day, even really quality, quality rooms, the same basic setup, the same set of drums moving from room to room, it's going to speak differently in different rooms because inherently a room already has these tones that are accentuated and tones that because of the accentuated nature of the, of the, the louder tones that are speaking more loudly – the, the other tones are taking a back seat. The day before, man, your floor tom and your kick drum ruled. Right. Today, man, the snare sounds great, but I got no bottom end on my kit. I had somebody ask me a question the other day that we get asked all the time. And for the first time, I actually I had a hard time answering it, which is, what's your favorite drum room to work in? Mm. The answer has changed over the years, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But now we've gotten to a point where a lot of the bigger studios are kind of what's left. There's not, a, you know, there's not a lot of fringe things. Yeah. And so a lot of the rooms are kind of becoming equal. And so it's less about the room and more about the engineer. Absolutely. That's the correct answer. And so I have a really yeah. hard time telling people a room where I say, hey, it's this room, but you should probably get this guy or this guy. You yeah. know, there are certain guys for certain rooms. But that's, you know, the, the thing that I've had to kind of come to terms with and the way that I've dealt with it has been a little different than probably how you deal with it, which is I, I feel terrible. Like, I don't love the way my studio sounds at home. I'm constantly messing with oh, it. Oh, me too, dude. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. You know, we're always, we're always trying. Work and in so, progress. Yeah. So I'm, the more I do that, the less sure I feel about how things are sounding at home, even though they're getting better. Like, yeah. I'm never going backwards in terms of sounds. Yeah. But in my brain, I'm, I'm still just as unsure, and I'm still, still trying. And so if I'm working at home for a lot, and then I go to a session, when I hear things different that don't sound like I want them, what I'm doing is I'm just assuming that that's what's actually right. Yeah, for the day. Yeah. And, and what can I learn from that sound that I can apply to back there that's actually good? Sometimes that's nothing because yeah. sometimes it is truly just a bad drum sound. Right, right. But, you mm -hmm. know... I, I don't say anything anymore, too, especially because I mean, I say that I, I mostly don't or I try and wait because sometimes what I think is a bad drum sound is a very intentional thing that's happening in the control room that is a direction that I'm not privy to yet. Yeah. You know, they're trying to go some like I need to be reading the clues from what they're giving me Boom. sonically. Read the room, man. Read the room. That's yeah. oh, my God. You know, we talk about it a lot on this podcast, but. There's so many situations where you don't think about reading the room. And, and one of those can be when you get a headphone mix and you go, this doesn't sound like the way I think it should sound for where I think yeah. this song is heading, Absolutely. which may mean that this song yeah. is going somewhere that you're you're not aware of. You're yet. just not hearing it correctly yet. Yeah. And yet it can be confusing and frustrating, particularly with our instrument, pretty visually basic when you look at our instrument uh there's 14 mics okay on the acoustic guitar there's two maybe one on the guitar cabinet there's two maybe one right it's the same thing it's just to get two different tones out of the same sound and blend them together or just use one or the other right it's a different thing with us that's why there are drum engineers and there, there are engineers. It's more about the engineer than the room. Mm -hmm. To me, I've always noticed that. After years of doing this, I'm like, I don't care where I am. If he's going to be there, it's going to be good. To understand the nuances of those 14 mics and turn it into a single, cohesive, powerful musical statement is an art form. You know, among the musicians on any given day that are on the floor, the drummer is more dependent on the engineer. Yeah. I steal from them. Yeah. 
Uh, you know, I how you, what are you doing? So man? you'll you'll ask. And yeah, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll ask and I'll visually just walk around and look. Because a lot of times, you know, there's tape that's the kick channel is going through the and hitting that and it's hitting that. And there's the mic. Okay, what's he doing? What's he got that set at? How that just seems so wrong, but man, it sounds so right. You know, because really, you know, to my point, let's quit looking at music and let's let's listen to it. Right. You know. I, I'm definitely all for technology. I'm all for the computer. I, I catch myself having to tell myself that all the time. I need to quit staring at my freaking screen while I'm listening to myself. I hate my kick drum placement. I constantly that much ahead. But when I you're on the screen, visually You can see it. Yeah. You yeah. can see it. When I'm listening to it, I'm like, Dang, that feels good. I got to listen with my my ears and my heart and my musical soul. I don't want to lose that to the technology and to the computer screen. Yeah. Do you and, quantize most of what you do? No. I'm curious. In situations like where you receive tracks where it's programmed drums and then everything else is kind of played to that, mm -hmm. where it's it's heavily on the grid, you'll still leave it as is and I turn and it in I turn it in as is that being said I'm I scope it I, I'm not just like I'm gonna play it two times and turn it in you're not gonna let something no. go out that you wouldn't. anything yeah. that leaves I want it to sound like a record yeah this is not a rehearsal this is not a hey you can fix it in the mix you do whatever you want to later but when I turn it in to me it could be the record you know yes and let's talk about that for a minute because that's something that i've noticed other players not doing very well I, i'm so excited to talk to you about this because we were talking earlier you were one of the first guys having a home studio and that's incredible and so you have such a, a depth of knowledge there and one of the things that i see being an issue is is roughs because that's that's our first impression that's our first time to show the client, this is what I think should should work here. Right. I'm so OCD. I listen, I will I will burn an MP3 just to send to somebody for a rough. But before I send it to myself on my phone, <laughs> and I listen to it on my phone mm -hmm. with headphones, without headphones. How's he gonna listen to this? You gonna listen in his car? Yeah. You gonna Nine times out of ten, he's gonna listen not on a pair of studio speakers. Do you, you know. ever send out a drum rough before you've done absolutely everything you want to do? Like it, if you have a client that you know is going to be difficult and you don't want to have to <clears throat> put in a ton of effort to get just a sketch idea? Occasionally. Uh, the way I combat people being picky, which it's their prerogative to be picky, it's their music. The way I combat this, and it takes some time that I'm not getting paid for, most of the time, even with people that I've worked with over and over again, pretty much require conversation, not a text, oh. an actual conversation on the phone. That kind of verbal communication to me is far more revealing than texts or, Got it. you know, hey, check out, you know, da -da -da, check out Miles on whatever, you know, I want it to kind of be like that. Um, I will check that out, but then I'll also talk to him about, so are you talking about, is it the sonic picture that you're liking or pattern, Right. you know, or the actual aggressiveness or what is it here that we're, we're really, that you're really inspired by? That, why do you want me to check that out? Because this song is nothing like that, right? So we've been, we've all, all been there, but to him, there's an aspect of that reference that he's sending to you or asking you to listen to. There's, there's, there's something about that that's tweaking him to the point where he wants you to listen to it. My question that I'm going to ask him live is, why? What is it? Tell me everything that you ever want to say right now, whether you actually have it pinpointed or not. Tell me everything you want to say about the drums on this song. Back to the dial. Back to the dial. I've had the conversation with the guy, so I know his language, and I know what he's wanting, expecting. I also know that he's wanting and expecting me 
Right. Because he sent it to me. Now, there might be another reason. There might be because the other guy wasn't available for two weeks and he wants it tomorrow. That's okay too. But still, he trusts me enough to come to me. But it's kind of like, you know, a compressor. Oh, I went too far past it. I got to reel that back. You know, it's that. Just dial it in. And when I'm by myself, I have the luxury. So I love experimenting like that. Actually, I think it makes me a better musician. What are some of the lessons that you've learned over the years that that you still kind of deal with or that were major? Like, yeah. I've got that one. I think this is a very important. Great question, man. Great question. And, and you know, it could go hours. Uh, you know, one, I'll just use a, a guy that we both worked for that, you know, a lot of you know, Dan Huff. We were working on a Jewel record, and I was there. I was the only musician there getting drum sounds, sitting by the drum set just talking. And he's like, every one of you guys is a, is a mini producer. And so one thing I think early on, some mistakes I made was thinking too much like a drummer and thinking too much about my drumming on this song. I'm not saying that's in, insignificant or unimportant, but he wants you thinking like him, like a producer, big picture, get past this little sphere of things that you're banging on, transcend that and get to what everybody else is playing and then get past that and get to the the the, the big picture of this thing. Thinking like a producer, I think is something that I didn't understand early on. I thought like a drummer. Certain songs or artists are better than others, but Another thing that I've let go of is judgment about that because that's and that's an exercise. That's a mindset. I can recognize that it's a crappy song, but I don't have to talk about it. But I think the minute that you let that kind of negativity in to the process, somehow it's going to be in the output whether it's your attitude or your playing or how it affects the experience of the other guys in the room. Yeah. Work ethic is very important. I think to all, you know, if if you want to be, do what we do. Although I'll say this, when somebody's singing their butt off during a take and in the pocket and knows the song Mm -hmm. and guides you through the song, it's fuel. Dude, great singers, when they lead the way through their song, I'm like, oh my God, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. Because we are reactors, man. We're all, you know, I learned this from jazz, the ensembles in jazz, the way, the the intensity of communication and listening to each other and reacting in that kind of improvisational setting is something that I, I carry in my bag with me. Yeah, You know, it's it's one of my tools that I use. I'm listening to the guitar part. And a lot of times, man, especially on the tros, on intros, turnarounds, outros, hooks, things like that. Oh, I am going to make up a part that goes with that guitar hook that sets it apart from the chorus and sets it apart from the, it's going to be a little different. Even if it's a chorus vibe on the turnaround or whatever, there's something going on different that I can just tweak a little bit, you know, and and set it apart. There is a question that I want to ask you that I, I especially think would be relevant for drummers starting out now. What do you bring for non-cartage situations Great where question. you have a house kit, but you still want to be creative? Primarily high, medium, low snares. Okay. Because within those two or three snares, each snare is three snares. Correct. In a way. But they're all set kind of. They're all kind of set. But in in an emergency situation, I can make this chrome over brass six and a half Gretsch totally crank up. Yeah. uh, Way higher than where it's kind of in the mid kind of range right now. I could, you know, and then in my backpack, just all different kinds of hitting objects. Such as? Well, just sticks. Two different size sticks. My everyday stick which is just a normal, innovative percussion drumstick. Then I have a pair of, of jazz. That are much thinner and lighter. And, and lighter. And yep. so if it's like, it doesn't even need to be jazz. Right. But if it's something where I feel like I could get the right feeling from the drums, 
without as much mass hitting the drum. And and those are typically they're a sharper bead on the edge, so you've got more cymbal depth. Yeah, I do yeah. the same thing. I've got I've got five A's and then I've got bebop twenty fives. That's or basically whatever. what same I did. thing. And then I'll I have some uh you know I have some uh you know dowels, whatever, and then several different kinds of brushes like plastic style of brushes and in between kind of nylon kind of conventional looking but it's nylon yep. brush and then and then the traditional wire brushes too and and mallets i i have a, a separate bag it's called roots eq it's basically like tea towels but they're sized a, a metal ring yes that's the size of the drum there's one kind that's just like that it's a thicker cloth and it just literally lays on the head and it's like instant, complete dead, right? But there's still a doom, there's still a tone. It's just, there's no sustain. But then they make a lighter one now. You know, you got your ring, it's laying on there. It doesn't quite literally lay on the head as heavily. It gives your drum a little bit more sustain. Yeah. You know, I've got some of those. Do you know uh, Mr. Muff? Have you seen those? No. It's like this thing. It looks almost, it looks like an animal. <laughs> it's like this real fuzzy thing that is on a, like a swivel and you clip to the rim and then this thing is being held up in the air by the magnet that's sticking to the clip and you just flip it down. It just lays on the drum, you know, nice. and then it. You know, for a live situation, if you wanted it on your snare drum for this song and then the next song, you want your snare drum to be more wide open, you just flip it up and the magnet catches the, the clip that's on the rim Got and it. it's just sitting there like that until you want it and then you just flip it down. Moon gels, duct tape, all of those kinds of things. Perk stuff? Tambourine, egg shakers, and then I have a, a couple of different kinds of... Uh, tambourine rings one or minor that's a, actually you know you clip it to the to your post of your hi-hat the cyclops guy yeah yeah got that you could do multiple things with that lay it on your floor tom yeah you can or you can have it laying on the hi-hat symbols or just up in the air on the rod you know to where when you move your footed you know and then the, um there's one that's that doesn't have that it's not for the uh, for the hi hat is meant to lay on something. It's a little single. It's kind of like that same minor thing, but without the contraption where you hook it. It's on the, the they call it. I think it's called the ching ring. And then I'll carry a couple of maracas in that bag. And then I have. It's basically this this ankle thing you're talking about at the very beginning of our yes, conversation. Yes, yes, you still use it, one of those. It's just basically this this ankle thing that it can go. It could go on your arm. It's got like five rows of of these bead things, and you do that. It's just like. Are you doing that with? So you, you can do it live on your drum track. Oh, sweet. Sometimes, okay. And sometimes it can get in the way because it doesn't always track with the groove. It can be like really behind and sloshy, <laughs> you know, and really be a nuisance. Yeah. So you got to be careful with that usage of it. But you can also just take that thing and what would be around your ankle. Take that and put it over the rod of your hi hat, and it's just like laying on top of your cymbals. And then there's a thinner version of that that I use too. And then in, in my bag, also multiple beaters. I've got a hard plastic beater. I've got the square felt. The Zorro is, guy. The Zorro. Yeah. That's my everyday beater Same. these days. These days, I like the weight of it, and I like the 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 attack the surface. consistency. Yes. Oh, yeah. It's so much easier to stay consistent yeah. with that beater. Use that. And then, you know, our soft kind of puffy beaters, just musically speaking, most house kit, this is a generalization, but most house kit situations, you're not going in to make a Peter Gabriel record. And I don't mean that as like better music or lesser music. I just mean as far as the expansiveness as to what they're wanting from the drum kit that day. Which means the right. depth of shit you might need. And, yeah. and the thing is, is yes, for the most part, that's not the case, but that's why I ask you the question, because there are those times where you're expected to show up for a house kit yeah. and they want all of it. Yeah. They want as much as they can get. Yeah. And you're going to have to provide that with whatever you have there with you. Yeah. So that's, I'm curious because you have such an endless ability to be creative and do stuff 
what you carry along. Yeah, a lot. Stuff I, like sometimes that. I would carry a, a some form of a little hand drum too. Okay, sometimes, good. Sometimes, like a a, a, a djembe, or um, you know those uh, I forget what it's called. It's made by Pearl, but it's a it's almost like a laptop conga. Mm -hmm. It's a conga without the body. Yep. And it, in a track, it sounds pretty. Those things freaking believe. I keep one of those with me. I've got the. I think it's the ten. Uh, but you know they don't make those anymore. Oh really? And they're like two hundred bucks each. They're like they're, but they sound like a conga, and especially yeah. for non cartage stuff to have something yeah. this big that you can just throw in your bag. Yeah, and when you when you play on a Margaritaville type song on a you know the a other, beach a beach song, oh boy, I wish we had some congas. Oh yeah, I can do this. Hey, Boom. Hey, what do you know? I've got I've got hand drums. Yeah, here. right. <laughs> Also, another thing to check out, uh, have you, there's just because you mentioned the name, it's called a laptop conga, but it's not. It's made by Meinl. It's a box. It's about this big. It's about this tall. So it's kind of like a big pizza box. And it it's separated. There's tonally, it's different on both sides. Ah. But it's it's a little more akin to um, a cajon in its sound because oh, it's yeah. just wood. There's no head. So it has a conga vibe tonally, but it has the attack of a cajon. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. Was there a moment where you realized it needs to be less about me and I, I this this is about you know what I'm being hired for? First of all, it's a daily a daily exercise because you know we're all musical artists and we all have things that we feel like that we can do to enhance the moment right artistically on a creative artistic level one of the things that that helps me is really being in tune with the room it's just like reading the room and understanding what the, the primary outcome expectation is and i think that's the key how can i contribute to that using the instrument that i have and, you know, and my capabilities. When something's really, really good, it's not really, really good because of one guy. Yes. And it's certainly not you. Right. <laughs> or at least that's how right. I have to think about it. I have so much respect for you as a, as a drummer because you are one of the most creative drummers I've ever known. I, uh, it's, it's unbelievable. And yes, sure, you've got it from somewhere. But again... I don't know those guys. I, I grew up watching you. So mm. it's it's oh, so cool. Dude, uh, mm. this is and it's so fun to be able to pick your brain on things that have been sitting in my <laughs> in my memory bank for a while. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, Miles. And you know, that means the world to me because all of this really still matters uh tremendously to me.